people uh, are organized to to click uh, in the uh, speakers exactly in this, uh, what is scheduled the time being. I think that it's better to follow the timetable, isn't it? Uh, so we have some ter uh, 13 minutes. Uh, what we shall do is perhaps introducing people who are going to talk, uh, uh, which is uh, usually done. We, we forgot to, to, to put a person to, to introduce what the the measure of ceremony what we call uh, who usually introduce people uh, so perhaps we can introduce professor jose, jose morais and uh, i can introduce him since we are uh, very long friends since uh, uh, 82 uh, last century. <laughs> uh, and uh, so Jose Moraes uh, is a, one of the most well known specialists in reading in the world. Uh, uh, he had made a lot of contribution in this field, and uh, namely, uh, based on psycholinguistic experiments uh, on how language is processed. He's a, a neuropsychologist, and so his contribution is very well based in those experiments. And uh, uh, namely, we cannot forget that he don't uh, uh, he also made a large contribution to the role uh, psycholinguists play in this world where there are so many inequalities and uh, his ideological position is very well known and it's also a large contribution. Uh, so, we thank in this moment, and I am a little bit uh, emotional, so I cannot speak anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Leono, uh, did you receive my email with the PowerPoint presentation? Ah, sorry. Sorry, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I thanks. I w want just to say thanks very much, Leonor, for uh, everything you said, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. To be here uh, to well to talk about uh, these important things. Uh, so let's well. Later, after, in an hour, you tell me what you think <laughs> about what I'm going to say. Uh, for the presentation, so for the slides, uh, I presume that it, uh, no, we have to wait 15, 15 minutes, a few minutes. Is it true, Rosangela? Um. 20 minutes, I think. Ah, 20. Ah, yes, it was uh, half an hour. OK. OK. Nine maybe we'll... precisely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to the 12th Zappel International Congress, um, which I'm certainly that it be a great event. Everybody, our welcome.
Maybe you should come back in 15 minutes, what you think? Yes, it's it's almost three minutes to begin. No, no, sorry. No, 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 it's more than that. We're supposed to, to begin at half past six. Yeah, maybe. Uh, we'll I think uh, Jose Moraes lecture. I I want to to say that um, for for some of you that uh, didn't accompany all the events uh, that preceded this conference, that uh, the the directory was new direct example directory was recently elected uh, uh, due to the fact that Isapple uh, didn't have uh, a, a presidency, neither a president, neither a secretary treasurer. Uh, uh, those uh, places were vacant and we had to, to fulfill them in order to to get the congress uh, done uh, i was uh, namely alone uh, doing all the job uh, and uh, uh, so uh, thanks to the election of the new director that it was possible to to do this event and uh, with the help of uh, the University of Santa Cruz do Sul uh, who uh, hosted the the Congress and uh, so it was possible. Uh, uh, no, no, I shared my screen. Uh, 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 so now that Douglas uh, put the the slide with the opening ceremony, and uh, many people are just arriving. Uh, my my daughter asked asked Jose to talk about your uh, pre previous presentations to this Congress and uh, which are your new research, if you can speak about that before your lecture. Please open your microphone, it's closed. Oh yes. <laughs> so please, uh, I should talk about. Sorry. You, uh, you what me. What are your uh, more recent research? Ah. If you 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 are doing something new. Well, I'll mention I'll mention something. Yes, during the my talk. Ah, okay. Are you going to mention, mention. there? Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be nice. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Douglas. Uh, do you have this slide only, or this is a presentation for with more? more okay. Well, perhaps, uh, perhaps I can read it again. The part, mm -hmm. the part, uh, greetings, because only now that uh, the slides are being shown to you. So I, I will repeat the greetings for those who just arrived because I'm seeing that many people are arriving now. I'll read again. I greet all participants of the 12 Apple International Congress 
who from all over the world attend us. In particular, I think thank President Marcos Maia, Secretary Treasurer Rosângela Gabriel, Councilor Angela Pinheiro, Dr. Douglas Vilhena and Socrates Duarte for their tireless efforts to ensure this Congress success. Of no lesser magnitude was the students' and monitors' contribution to the Congress efficiency. I also thank the Santa Cruz do Sul University Brazil, UNISC, which is hosting the Congress. Next, please. Well, now I think that he, <laughs> he went to another slide. Is showing uh, some uh, other slides that do not belong to the greetings. Uh, you can see here the members of the founding com ISAPL committee, com uh, which is the late President uh, Tatiana Slama Kazako, and she was really the founder of uh, ISAPL. Uh, uh, helped by Renzo Titoni from Italy, who was one of the uh, first pres vice presidents. The treasurer was also the late Miguel Chiguan Soler from Spring Valley. Uh, 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 Renzo Titoni is also, uh, also died. Also, Oxfa, Oxer from Germany, West Germany, Wilga, Wilga Rivers from the United States, and uh, le, the late uh, Len, uh, Leonchev from the, uh, uh, I don't know how do we say in English, Soviet Union, the late, late also, the Soviet Union. The secret. Uh, Terry General was also the late Hans, Hans Deckard from West Germany. And members, Bronckert is still alive from Switzerland. David Bruce, I don't know from Great Bend C if he, she, he is still alive. Cass from Canada. Prussia from Czechoslovakia is died. I am still alive <laughs> in my 90, 90 12 year. And Taburet, Taburet Keller also died. Okay. The, the, those were the, the founding ISAPL committee. And uh, the, it took place in Milano, Italy in 82 in a meeting promoted by the uh, Associação Internacional de Linguística Aplique, AILA. Here we see, so the first meeting was in Milan in 1982, then in Barcelona, uh, and in Kassel, Toronto, where I was elected the president in the University of Toronto, the first mandate of this apple. I was elected in Toronto, in, at the University of Toronto. Then in Florianópolis, we organized the uh, first and unique international uh, uh, psycholinguistic seminar. I think that uh, Jose, were you present, present in the seminar in Florianópolis in 93? I think that you were there. Uh, then we have a, meet, a, a congress in Bologna, uh, Cesena, Italy, and then in Porto. I hope Maria da Graça Pinto is present here. Porto, 
You yes. were the nice. Yeah. Are yes. you listening? Are you remember. listening? Are, are you listening to do, me? Do. Uh, we, yes, 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 Professor Maria okay. da Graça. Uh, yeah. We are. We yeah. can listen you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You remember. <laughs> and we can progress. see you too. You can yeah. see me? Okay. Yes, you we can see you. No problems anymore. <laughs> I've done I've done a good job. Yes, you have done a good <laughs> job. Very good. <laughs> on on Tuesday, oh, on Tuesday, on Tuesday, we could not manage to see you and to listen to you, but today is fine. Thank okay. you. So, okay. Thanks to Douglas, the problem was solved, wasn't it? Maria da Graça. Me? Yes. Oh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, remem rem uh, remembering the Congress is Apple organized. Uh, so then uh, after the Porto Congress, uh, the meeting took place in the University of in France, it was also a, a large meeting. Then in Czechin, Poland, in 2004. Uh, and then in Brazil, uh, again, it was organized at the Univers Pontificia Univers Catholic uh, University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, uh, Professor Marcelino organized this Congress in, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Then there was a, another Congress in Italy at the University of Bari organized by Professor Minini, uh, where Rosangela Gabriel attended and where, when she met José Moraes and Regine Kolinsky, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. It yes. was <laughs> under the, the ISAPL umbrella that you, you, you meet. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Apple, and thank you. Yeah. And then we have the 10th Congress. It was a magnificent Congress at Moscow. Ufintseva, uh, Professor Ufintseva uh, was the organizer with the help of Irina. Uh, Professor Rivina, uh, uh, they organized the, the 10th Congress at Moscow. It was also a great Congress. And then the 11th uh, Congress in, at, uh, at Georgia, Tbilisi. Uh, this was the last Congress before our online congress which as I'll, i told you, you see that, that there is a large period between the 11 congress which took place in uh, 2016 and the the order should be at 2019 but there were so many problems that only now we are joined, fortunately. I think that now, uh, uh, here you see the organizing committee of this Congress. And you can see the names of Professor Dr. João Torrão and uh, Professor Maria Teresa Roberto from the University of Aveiro, which, who are mentioned because they 
they open their arms to help us to organize the 12th Congress at the University of Aveiro. But uh, since we could not have an presential Congress, we could not use the University of Aveiro, which opened their rooms to host our Congress, but in homage of those uh, help, their names are mentioned in the organizing committee. And here you can see all the names of the International Scientific Committee. Many of them are present now. Thank you for all your help. Well, here you see the book of abstract, which uh, was namely organized by Angela Maria Pinheiro and Douglas Villena. He is a very young researcher who recently got his PhD degree. No more than a week, isn't it, Douglas? Well, it was two weeks ago I, I defended my thesis. Yeah. Okay. Recent. This is my first week officially with a PhD. Well, I don't know if uh, these 165 presenters uh, uh, <laughs> continue uh, now, here now, because now, there were presenters. few uh, uh, who could not uh, join in the last minute. And uh, so uh, perhaps the 165 must be rearranged to accommodate all of this new situation. Professor Jose Moraes, I think that your time arrived. Thanks, uh, yes, I can. Uh... Uh, well, perhaps, uh, uh, Douglas, if you can show my first slide. And um, Jose, yes? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, manage the, your uh, slides, okay? Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. So, Douglas and I don't, don't uh, fight. Uh, well, I, first of all, of course, I'd like to say good morning to all of you those I can see and those uh, who, who are invisible to me, but they, I know there are many, uh, more than 50, in the, for the moment, uh, more than 50 people, I think. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, very much the board of Isabel for, for, for inviting me. And, uh, uh, well, what I present, I present today, so the title is Applied Psycholinguistics in a Time of Harsh Debates. Actually, there are always harsh debates, but uh, they change. <laughs> so you see, perhaps, uh, during my presentation, what I, I want to, to say. Uh, now, what I present next, please. What I present today is my... Douglas? Ah, yes, okay. My vision of language and cognition. Also, how these concepts have changed in the short history of what we call now uh, cognitive sciences. And uh, to finish the role, not to finish because it's present during all my uh, lecture, uh, the role of a further concept, uh, literacy. So, uh, I want to evoke first the object of, of our society, so applied psycholinguistics. It's, its two sources are linguistics, the, 
the science of language and psycholinguistics, the science of human language processing. And an important purpose of uh, applied psycholinguistics is, of course, human language education and re-education, but not only. And I was happy to see that uh, the present Congress was open to other topics. Uh, the next, please. Next slide. So cognitive issues, language and cognition, sociocultural, social communication, analysis of literary texts, artificial language, political questions, and uh, within commas, the titles of, the, uh, of this Congress, uh, in, uh, presented by this Congress. Uh, well, uh, language is also an important uh, object of cognitive psychology and of the more general cognitive science. What is cognition? Well, cognition is the process of knowing and knowledge in large part is obtained through language and expressed in language. So perhaps you will be surprised, but I'm much older than cognitive science and even than cognitive psychology. The inaugural book of this science, Cognitive Psychology, uh, with this title, has been written by Ulrich Neisser and published in 1967. It had, it had a huge influence, and until now, it has been mentioned in almost 14,000 pa 14, papers and books. It's very clear, and uh, it deserves to be read, even, uh, even today. Then the following general generation was involved in a strong debate. The next slide, please. On, on one side, Jerry Fodder, author of Modularity of Mind in 83, uh, which received until now more than 18,000 mentions. And with his colleague, Zenon Pilishin, they argued that the unconscious processes leading to conscious recognition of oral and written language are mod modular and informationally encapsulated. In other words, they occur separately and strictly from bottom to up, from the sensory representation to conscious recognition. So, for example, the auditory recognition of a spoken word is not influenced by its visual characteristics. And the visual recognition of a written word is not influenced by the auditory or phonetic characteristics. But now we know this is not true. And on the opposite side, Jay McClelland and David Rumelart in parallel distributive processing 86, so uh, quite close to the book by our father, uh, they propose that processing is not strictly bottom-up. There may be retro-propagation of the information, and more abstract information can influence less abstract information. For example, semantic properties can influence the recognition of formal features. The theory was verified both on computer simulation and experimental studies. Now, at that time, neither of those theories admitted or expected intermodality activation. For example, that the phonetic and phonological processing of a spoken word can be influenced by its written form. These cognitive theories lost much of their influence. Uh, next, please. Because in the 90s began the neuroscientific revolution due to a major technological improvement, the magnetic resonance Im imaging, which became more and more sophisticated and enabled the researchers to see the areas that are activated in the brain during specific tasks. The brain imagery has also an economic impact, a strong economic impact. Science left the rooms of small laboratories and became an industrial project, part of the capitalist economy. 
And now many young students are competing for research grants in neuroscience labs, but the selection, as most of us know, is merciless. Epistemologically, there was a reversal in the roles. The next, please. Please. The, uh, yes, the brain ceased to be a biological tool to become the subject of the human actions. And now we can see very frequently expressions like the brain processes or the brain learns. For example, it learns to read and write. And these are current expressions, even in scientific papers. We as protagonists are disappearing behind our brain. The operating individual becomes a brain. And it, my brain, because it's it, is guiding me. Fortunately, there are neurocognitive researchers who refuse the reverse, this reversal of the direction of causality. I belong to those who think that acquiring literacy changes the brain, not the reverse. Acquiring literacy changes the brain both deeply and consistently by recycling specific functional neuronal sets and by strengthening their connections with areas involved in language and cognition. The next, please. But it is not the brain that changes you, it's the reverse. By using your brain in reading and writing, you change it. Actually, we began changing our brains a long time ago when we were not sapiens. Our brain is a product of our action, of our praxis. The organ does not change per se. It is changed by the accomplishment of the corresponding function. If we sapiens are able to change the world, it is due to the activity of our ancestors, in particular their manual activity. The sensitivity and the motricity of the hand and the mouth, namely of Homo erectus, were represented in their brains. Next, please. The sapiens hand is, was not independent of his or her language. There is serious evidence that the stone manufacture and the primitive languages shared one area, the F5 brain area, homologous of the present Broca's area, which in the sapiens is crucial for speech articulation. And you can see, for example, this very, very interesting paper in Brennan language. Uh, but well, uh, it develops, of course, this idea. Next, please. Uh, and Rizzolatti and Arbib, even before, so it was in 1988, uh, in trends in neuroscience. Uh, it's there, so okay. Uh, so Rizzolatti and Arbib were among the first to propose that the human language evolved both from a, a mechanism that was not concerned with communication, uh, but with the capacity to recognize and coordinate actions. Syntax, including recursiveness, shares with manual praxis the concatenation and the ordination of bits of action. This might explain why syntax and manual praxis share common or very close brain areas. And uh, I suggest also reading this, this uh, paper uh, and, all, uh, and another one for, by the same author in Cortex the same year. Um, well, I believe that both communication and actions depend on our will, our voluntary decisions. And will and decisions are registered, of course, in the brain. We have the signature. We are the pilot, even if we are not always rational. 
and aware of our desires and uh, real motivations. In this moment, I'm reading a spe and speaking to you, and I hope you are listening to me. You are, I think. <laughs> uh, but it was not my brain that decided. I could stop now if I wanted. I will not, of course, but I could. Uh, some of you may take the decision of attending preferably what I say or what is written in the slides. This is what cognitive psychologists call selective attention. It's you, not your brain, that decides to orient your attention. Now, it may, difficult, may be difficult for us and for our brains to attend and process two different messages presented simultaneously, even if one is written and the other spoken. The next slides. Ah, yes, it's there. So uh, it's a very interesting paper, very recent, published um, in February, I think, uh, last February, by Cohen, Laurent Cohen, and uh, including other researchers and uh, at last author uh, Stanislas de Han. And so they address this issue of selective attention for language, uh, both uh, with written and with spoken stimuli. So the authors presented either sentences or word lists in one sensory modality, auditory or visual, and in some conditions they influenced the participants' attention by presenting concurrently distractors in a different sensorial modality, either visual patterns or melodies. And this led to a strong decrease in, of the activation of the anterior and mid-lateral parts of the cortex. In those regions, the brain activation was particularly reduced for the written material. In contrast, as you will see in the next slide, the attentional conflict did not prevent a strong response of the posterior or ventral occipital temporal cortex to the latter strings. And you can see it's the yellow region. The processing of letter strings at this site, is key, which is called visual word form area, this processing is automatic. So it does not, it is not influenced by selective attention. That one very peripheral, so one of the first uh, processing that is, uh, that operates on written stimuli is automatic. Obviously, this happens only for literate people because they learn to read. Uh, in illiterate people, of course, the area, this area is not specifically activated by letters. As it was shown, please, the next slide, by an international group, uh, French, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Belgian, led by Stanislas Dahan, the first author of that paper published uh, in science in 2010. Uh, well, note that this, in this paper, we also found a significant activation of the visual word form area in a top-down, in, in an auditory task uh, of lexical decision. But of course, as expected, only in highly literate subjects. So there is um, both a top-down effect and a cross-modality effect, although the stimuli in that task were auditory. So they were not, uh, that's very interesting because the stimuli were auditory and there is an activation of the visual form area, which is specialized in the processing of written words or uh, written pseudo words. But in this case, uh, the activation was, uh, presented for, uh, audit, for, uh, the, for the task co that concerned auditory words, and it did happen for the uh, auditory pseudo-words. Um, 
Well, the cross, this cross modality finding and the activation of the visual world form area in the Cohen and our collaborators that I showed you before, they both are consistent with the idea that the visual world form area is activated automatically. But now we can say that it is regardless of attention and of sensorial modality. This implies that the literate skills installs itself, itself in deep, low-level visual areas of the brain. And this is not uh, due to any a priori characteristic of the brain. It's due to uh, a change of a functional change in the brain due to our, uh, to our uh, abilities, in particular, uh, the development of literacy. Well, uh, but this is only half of the story. Uh, uh, there is uh, another half, which is that uh, literate language also colonizes anterior, anterior areas of the brain. So we have seen what happens in the posterior part, and now we can see what happens in the anterior. So in this, uh, in this uh, paper by a Spanish uh, PhD student, Lope, Diana Lopez Barroso, uh, and also in a, a further paper by the group, uh, uh, well, the, 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 well at, but now let me concentrate on, on, in this, on this slide. So they found that there is an increase of the connectivity between the posterior visual word form area and the anterior regions that are involved in language, including Broca's area. And this was observed in the best readers, so indicated in the, it's the black column, uh, among exiliterates. So they were not, uh, they, they had not learned to read when they were young children. So they, were ex-illiterate adults, but the best readers had more, uh, greater connectivity between the two areas, the, the posterior and the, uh, and the anterior, than the uh, poor readers, so in blue, and of course, uh, very small uh, connectivity for the illiterates. So it's clear that literacy contributes the practice and the development of the skill of reading and writing uh, leads to uh, an increase of the connectivity uh, between the networks involved in vision and in the language processing. Now, again, I ask the question, what is the driving force? The brain. No, we need the brain, of course. Without the brain, we wouldn't do anything. But the driving force is our mental activities and, above all, our literate language and, and uh, cognition. Now, a very interesting question is why both language and cognition have changed so much and so fast in the last 5,000 years? And this is a very short time period compared to what happened in the previous hundreds of thousands years for the, this, uh, this special uh, animal called uh, Homo sapiens. Well, the key to understand this huge revolution, I cannot call it an evolution, but revolution is the invention of writing, a major technology comparable in importance to the much older technologies that allowed our ancestors to make tools from stones and produce fire. Most probably, the writing systems have been created without awareness of the involved cognitive operations. In the case of the alphabet, the phoneme was only conceptualized in the end of the 19th century. So about 3,000 years after the creation of the first alphabet. This technological revolution is still in progress as it just entered in a new age, the age of digital literacy. 
What is the phoneme? Well, we cannot say that the phoneme exists in the same sense as we say that atoms exist in the matter. The phoneme is a concept created by linguists and inherited by the psycholinguists. It's useful, very useful, to analyze the spoken language, uh, the spoken languages that are alphabetic, alphabetically written, and to bet also very useful to better teach children and adults to read and write in an alphabet. However, many generations learned to read, and some people wrote extraordinary texts in this system, having no idea of what is, could be the phoneme, and never heard the word phoneme, of course. It was the case of a playwright like Shakespeare, a philosopher like Spinoza, they ignored the abstract relations between acoustic patterns created by articulatory registers. And the, of course, it is scientific research and thinking that allowed us to infer such abstract relations. The phoneme is not uh, a physical unit uh, of speech or of spoken language. It is a concept uh, a mental representation. For many years, I've written that alphabetic illiterates are not aware of the phoneme. The expression be aware presupposes that what we are, we are aware of exists. If we are aware, it means that that thing must exist. So the expression I used was not correct, is not correct in my view now. We have a tendency to reify, to give matter consistency to abstract relations. If the psycholinguistics want to present the phoneme as a unit, then, well, call it an abstract unit, but uh, it doesn't exist. I discussed this in my uh, last paper. Uh, uh, so I'm refer just because I, I have other things to say today, but I would suggest if you are interested in this question to read, um, let me see, ah, yes, please, the next. Yes, so this paper was published, well, I can say it's published because it's accessible through Google Scholar, but the issue will appear only next August, I think. And it's in uh, in a special issue uh, in honor is a tribute to uh, Jack Meller, who died last year. And uh, there are, I think, sixty papers in this um, tribute to Jack Meller. And my own tribute was the phoneme, uh, a conceptual heritage from alphabetic literacy. And what I say there is that what in what I believed in the beginning of my career in terms of language actually is not, is not correct. I, I have to say now that the phoneme doesn't exist. We just have, we developed the concept of phoneme. Uh, so I'd like to persuade you that we will not have a good idea uh, of language just by studying language, language or of cognition just by studying cognition. We have a tendency to isolate the domains, to introduce frontiers between them in the same way as we introduce frontiers between humans and call them races or nations. Next, please. Language is also cognition, because everything we say or write in principle conveys meaning and reflects knowledge. And cognition is also language, because without language, we cannot communicate knowledge or meaning. Now, there is a lot more to say about language and cognition. Because literacy was invented, and now we have many levels of literate language and of literate cognition. And we also have illiterate language and illiterate cognition. Well, 
Regine Kolinsky and I have estimated that, that literacy cannot be reduced to the skill of reading and writing, and that it has a strong impact on both language and cognition. So they all are interrelated. Language, cognition, literacy. The next, please. So, so in Kolinsky and Morai, so the first one is in Lani Psychologique, but it's written in, in English. We suggested that many, it's just a small citation, we suggested that many scholars wear literate glasses that lead them to disregard or underestimate the contribution of literacy to cognition. And those who believe to be studying ordinary oral language are actually primarily studying the properties of written language. In another second paper, uh, seeing sort of cultural cognitive tools. So this one uh, is still is also accessible through Google Scholar. We argue with examples that uh, mention literacy has been shown to impact speech perception, linguistic and non-linguistic visual perception, me verbal memory, sentence comprehension and production, as well as higher level cognitive capacities such as abstract thinking. So I'll not detail here the experimental or testing findings, but I have said so it's accessible. Uh, so you can, uh, if you are interested, to, to look at it. Now, it's worthless to discuss language, cognition, and literacy without referring to their owners. Their owners, I mean the social human beings. The differences in literate cognition and language are cause and effect of both cause and effect of huge and terrible inequalities. And new terrible inequalities are being created because now literate language includes literacy of natural language and of computational language. And literate cognition includes expertise in natural intelligence, but also in artificial intelligence. So the new full literates will become the new elite. And the new illiterates and poor readers will become the new people. Unless the present people in which we are included and whatever their degree of literacy, unless we can achieve a social, economic, political and ethical revolution. To finish, I think I've done, yes. Uh, I comment very shortly about science and culture in relation to literacy. Science uh, is one of the babies engendered by literacy. But many scientists are not aware of the role played by literacy. It's surprising because they spend around 50% of the scientists spend a, about 50% of their time reading or writing. So it comes from, it is not just my idea, it was shown by, by in a paper, uh, I don't remember the name, but, well, sorry, I don't remember, but it, it's in a paper. Uh, they did, uh, count, they counted uh, the, the time that scientists uh, attribute to different activities, including so uh, reading and writing. Uh, literacy has been and remain, remains absolutely essential to store, communicate and increase new knowledge. And the same happens as regards culture. Many, if not all aspects of our life are determined, conditioned or chosen by the fact that we live in natural and in social contexts. And culture is what we do uh, to transform these contexts. It includes economic and political activities, our relationships with the others and our attitudes toward them, towards them from empathy to violence. None of this is immune to literacy or lack of it. Our illiterate activities, or the lack of them, contribute to determine our needs and our character. 
But the literate people find most of their literacy effects, effects on culture so trivial, they consider them so trivial that they don't notice how much we are enculturated by literacy and by other vectors of culture. I looked at the writings of several remarkable authors in philosophy of science and cognitive science and find I found nothing or almost nothing that evokes a role for literacy. It's very, very strange. But most of these people are excellent uh, thinkers. Well, they, they don't look at literacy. One of the more productive among the philosophers of cognition and neuroscience is William Bechtel professor at the University of San Diego, and his important book, really important, really interesting, called Mental Mechanisms, Philosophical Perspectives on Cognitive Neuroscience. It's from 2008. Well, in it, I didn't find the words literacy or literate. No, nothing, nothing about it. Take Jerry Fodder, for example, to him, the cognitive theories are committed to a language of thought. That's the expression, it's the language of thought, which he intentionally called mentalese. It's innate and cannot be learned to Jerry Fodder. Hence, it cannot be literate. And then he's, he's consistent with himself. It, does, it, does, it doesn't talk about, it doesn't refer literacy, of course, because mentally is, is innate and cannot be learned. Well, this medium uh, that is required by thinking uh, is necess is, uh, must be literate because uh, language uh, requires it. It's, it's inform informative and precise. But of course, it's not only uh, literate language. It can be, this medium can be also images, movements, effects, emotions, attitudes. In order to know about the human beings, we learned a lot from cognitive linguistics and psycholinguistics. But we must also learn from other sciences. And I think that we cannot distinguish, we can, dis we can distinguish, but we cannot separate the sciences, because they all converge and they all uh, interact. And uh, for example, we have a lot, lots of things to learn from an anthropology. And there is the, 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 the slide so, uh, that concerns what I'm going to, to say. So an anthropologist, Lebner, warned us that the most recent anthropology overcultivated the concept in contrast with previous anthropologists of the 20th century. In the paper, No Such Thing as a Concept, Lerner wrote that the, in the British anthropolo anthropological tradition, beginning with Malinowski, there was no such thing as a concept. So the recognition of literacy led also to the recognition of what is really is a concept. A concept is a literate, co is a, a, a literate concept. The individual mind is nothing out of the social, economic, political, cultural, ideological, and psychological relations. The mind alone cut off all those relations. I mentioned the, 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 the mentalities, but it's the same for the mind. So the apparent substance of this language. The mind alone, cut of all those relations, is a phantasm. The mind doesn't exist. I'm sorry, but our mind, what we call mind, doesn't exist. What exists in our thinking is the literate concept of mind. So it's a concept. The isolation and fixation of concepts through literacy, when drawn from the context that explains them, produce such hallucinations. The belief that we possess a mind, an internal organ or power, 
is linked to the necessity of assuming that some instance in ourselves com com commands our desires, effects, thoughts, memories, decisions, and acts. Esprit in French, espíritu in Portuguese, of an older origin, a religious one, but modern literacy gave it a different meaning. The old, the old English words for mind and remind did not appear before the 14th century, and the expressions never mind and don't mind appeared only in the 18th and 19th centuries. It seems that the educated British high social class may have been the deter determinant of such meanings and expressions. Next, please. We wrote in uh, uh, Moraes and Kolinsky 2021, so uh, the oh well, the same, same paper I already mentioned. We wrote there that literacy allowed fixing mental processes as mind, which is nothing more than a conceptual abstraction that cognitive scientists forgot that billions of people are non-literate and that most of these could uh, but do not share the same kind of, uh, of mind as ours. And we invited cognitive scientists in that paper, we invited cognitive scientists to read our science with new eyes, as there is no mind, neither quantities of minds. There are people, each with a history of mental processes. The next, please. Interestingly, Quite interestingly, the great philosopher Gilbert Ryle, who wrote The Concept of Mind in 1949, uh, never used the concepts literacy or literate in his book, but he employed only once the word obliterate. That's amusing. It's uh, a lit obliterate is a literate equivalent of eliminate and of other, other words. So indeed, Ryle, Gilbert Ryle, unconsciously obliterated something important. In contrast, you have at the beginning of the Enlightenment, Diderot, who 200, year, 200 years earlier wrote, Le cerveau est un livre qui se lit lui-même. The brain is a book that reads itself. The metaphor, the brain, is a book, is the recognition that the brain needs the nutrient brought by the book, the prototype of literacy. The book is the prototype of literacy. For the brain, he used the metaphor sire sensible et vivant, sensitive and lively wax. In other words, the brain is malleable, open to reorganization, and that occurs given our activities, everything we do. And indeed, learning literacy deeply changes the brain functions and its connectivity, as we have seen. So to conclude, I come back to applied psycholinguistics, which in my view is psycholinguistics applied to a large scope of individual, cultural, and sociopolitical problems. I reject the solipsist idea advanced by Chomsky in his book on nature and language 2002, that language is due to a drive in some organisms to communicate with themselves. In my view, language, including inner language, is a product of social communication, which through multiple exchanges became structured. We are not unique, other animals developed structure structured language, name, not the same kind of structure, but anyway, structured language, namely some species or even many species of birds and some other mammals, mammals like uh, whales and dolphins. We should also recognize the great revolution in language that resulted from the invention of writing. This invention had a huge impact on both language and cognition and is at the origin of self-transformed and transtemporal cumulative science. It changed culture, economics, and politics. 
we should stop thinking, thinking and talking about language and literacy as if they were independent of the nature, more precisely of ecology. And similarly, they are not independent of the human society, of culture, culture, economy, social relations, and politics. The mastery of spoken language, as well as the mastery of literate language and literate knowledge, are and have always been the privilege of a min minority across the history. The property of high-level language and literacy is largely confounded with wealth and with prestige in the case of the academic or intellectual elites. But this does not prevent the rich and the elites from welcoming populist presidents of low-level literacy literature culture, who incense the people demagogically, but act against it, against that people, and contribute to the sharpening of the economic and social inequalities. That's the terrible situation today. And I think that we need to have, that's why I called, I put in the title of my speech, uh, harsh debates. We need to have also harsh debates in our, in our sciences. Um, well, applied psycholinguistics uh, looks for ways of preventing impairments such as dyslexia, but it must also study ways of helping everybody to reach high level language, literacy and cognition in connection with educators and with people who believe in the equality of rights. When I was young, there were popular universities. Now the expression is quite rare, but we need popular universities as well as high level schools for the children of the poor people. I hope that both the applied and the theoretical psycholinguistics will involve themselves in this fight. The next and the last. OK, so thanks very much for your attention. Uh, now, of course, I'm ready to answer your questions. And um, well, I put uh, to end uh, a sentence. It's from an author of the 19th century. And I put it there because I think I think it uh, corresponds quite well to the idea, uh, to the idea I wanted now to, more literacy, of course, I would like to convey, which is the idea of the unity of science, that many domains of science are interconnected. And I read the sentence, if I'm active in the field of science, I'm also socially active. Natural science will, in time, subsume the science of man, just as the science of man will subsume natural science. There will be one science. That's, in, that's, terri that's in incredible, because I don't know if you, know, if you have an, uh, any idea about who was the, the author uh, of this sentence that uh, proposes that uh, there is, after all, one science, which is both cultural and natural. You, are, you will be very surprised. It was written uh, in manuscripts, who, which were published later on. Uh, the, the, the famous manuscripts of 1844, and the author is Karl Marx. So our society is discriminatory and it separated the intellectual with linguistic skills and the manual work. But in the brain and in the, and in the researchers, in the researcher who writes papers on the computer, they remain linked. And we have to take this as an important, uh, well, uh, way uh, for thinking now uh, language cognition, literacy, etc. Well, thanks very much.
I don't know who, who were the first to. Well, if I'm plugged in, I can be the first. Okay. <laughs> um, your uh, paper, I would agree vastly with what you said about the mind and about language. But I find that your references are only Western references. And I think at once to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. In the 6th century before Christ, Buddha preached a conception of a sixth sense that he called Sita. And that sixth sense is what we call the mind. And we are 6th century before Christ. In the 3rd century before Christ, the monks of Sri Lanka started transcribing that purely oral preaching into a language that they invented for it, Pali. And of course the word is Seta in Pali, just as it was, or it was in the preaching of Buddha. And that makes me think of something else. Buddha said that you have the five basic senses that give you sensations, but you have a sixth sense, the mind, Sita, that is able to analyze the sensations or the impulses coming from the five senses and at the same time analyze its own constructions and uh, cogitations on the five senses or basic senses. And that is, I think, typically uh, typical of Buddhism, but typical of Asia too. That's the philosophy of Confucius the Confu and so on. And it is not centered on what European thinkers and North American thinkers think. And that you very nicely, very clearly expressed. And I say once again, I would agree with a good 80% of what you said. But it would be interesting to try to integrate Buddhism into that conception of the mind that you express. That's all for me. Okay, thanks very much. Well, I completely agree what, with what you said, and I'd like to integrate <laughs> Buddha and uh, other traditions in, uh, in, in what uh, I'm writing for the moment. But uh, I must say, confess that I'm li limited, quite limited in my literate culture. So uh, it will be not it won't be easy to to complete or well, at least to enrich my culture. But I completely agree with necessity of taking into account those tradi traditions. What uh, well, what I studied a little bit, but I couldn't. I would be unable to write. But just I stayed the conditions in which under which the Korean alphabet was was created. And I think it's it's a wonderful, a wonderful alphabet, even in the aesthetical uh, aspect, because it's really beautiful. And it's very beyond the, uh, well, that aspect is, it's, it's very, it's very important because, well, it's very informative because it informs about phonemes and it informs about the syllables. Uh, so it's it, it seems very uh, very useful for learning to read. So I don't can I can't read in, in, with this alphabet, but it seems to be really very 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 useful, very very interesting. But I I, I completely agree. So it, of course you are right. It was it was limited my <laughs> my talk certainly. <laughs> Another Professor Jose Moraes. Yes, Leo. I want to ask uh, uh, something. Could you explain a little bit if those changes caused by written language or other kinds of uh, learn, learned uh, knowledge uh, are epigenetic? 
and not genetic ones. And secondly, I think that uh, your uh, position uh, is qual, uh, quite, quite uh, uh, well, fine. I, to mention the contribution of Vygotsky, Luria, and Leontiev's thought about how the social uh, uh, impact has uh, to to the inner language to inner inner language in yeah. inner language yes yes the, those are the two observations well uh, uh, well con uh, well concerning the 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 origins of our so literate literate cognition i think that it's mainly cultural i have no idea that uh, well I, I i found no information uh, concerning uh, a biological a biological influence of any kind no. um, of course it's 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 it develops in the context of the biological possibilities offered by by the by our by our biological system but uh, i never i don't didn't find it perhaps but i didn't find any any information uh, other than uh, a cultural 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 changes due to the activity uh, including the activity of reading. Now, concerning uh, Luria and uh, the, the Sovietic uh, psychologists of, of that epoch, maybe, but uh, I have a problem with uh, uh, many interpretations that have been offered, for example, by Luria concerning, uh, concerning for example, reasoning. Uh, because uh, he did very interesting experiments, but some of those experiments uh, would require um, more uh, attention and to be developed in uh, with more with greater control. So I'm not sure uh, we can well uh, take them as they are. For, Hi, thank you, José, for your beautiful lecture. And uh, I'd like to ask you a question. I mean, you mentioned the work of R.B. Ben Kemmer and uh, stressed the, the role uh, of uh, recursion in, in language and uh, cognition. I have read recently a paper by Vichetsky, I think this is the way his name is pronounced, in which it talks about prefrontal synthesis and compares it to linguistic uh, merge in the sense that uh, you can synthesize novel mental imagery from two or more objects stored in memory. Maybe we could hear you a little bit more about this interesting topic. Oh, uh, well, I am not obviously aware of the of the discussion between the Chomsky and the, the anti-Chomsky Chomsky concerning the, the origins. Well, I, I prefer Chomsky, the political man in Chomsky. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, well, anyway, he is cert he's certainly right. In most of the descriptions uh, he, and the models he, he offered concerning language, I'm not saying uh, well that's something that we have to put aside. No, certainly not. Uh, now uh, the idea that uh, uh, some gene. Uh, 
random gene modification in our biology led to the development of language is a bit strong. It's a bit strong. <laughs> so I, I don't accept it. No. Uh, now many of the model modelings by models by by Chomsky concerning recursion, etc., are very interesting. To what extent they uh, are certainly correct, but uh, to what extent that explains the whole of language? Uh, well, for me, the whole of language has to include also the language of other animals, not just uh, the human, but even for the, the human, or the, the human, well, there are some indications that, uh, at least before the sapiens, uh, there were uh, grammars that did not include uh, uh, recursion. Well, I think it's an open question. For me, it's an open question. It's not closed. Thank you. Dear Professor José Moraes, Hi. I think your presentation, uh, the main point is that the phoneme has an abstract concept so it took many thousands of thousands of years for this conclusion so it is not obvious for the whole population <laughs> especially not illiterates it's very hard for uh, for everyone to abstract about the language and know that the graphene to phoneme correspondence it is not obvious no, it should always be explicitly taught. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I said that perhaps we could use the idea of abstract unit. It's a concept of an abstract unit. And indeed, if we take, uh, because, well, how can we infer a, a phoneme from the, from the, well, the acoustic description of the speech signal. You have to take into account abstract relations between uh, that are in the in that acoustic description. And uh, I think that uh, things began to change with the work by Studer, by uh, Alvin Lieberman, Studer Kennedy, and others in the in the Haskins laboratories. Actually, they have shown that uh, the phoneme is nowhere and everywhere. It's in the relations between these uh, acoustic parts of the, of the acoustic signal. Uh, but it's really uh, an abstract relation. Maybe the theory will change. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and I change my point of view, but for the moment, I think that the phoneme doesn't exist in the full sense of the word to exist. I could I could add just the following because it it's not hard for me <laughs> to to arrive at this conclusion because when I when I began to 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 work on uh, on speech perception and then on the on the phonemic abilities or awareness uh, I tried to find a word to uh, to to notate what uh, uh, literates, what illiterates were and, and were of. And I couldn't say that the literates became aware of phonemes and that the other ones were unaware of phonemes. It, it was very difficult to, to so I, I, I called in my first papers on that topic, I used phonetic because I didn't want to, to use an abstract, so abstract word like phoneme. So I used phonetic, but I, I talked about phonetic awareness and the awareness was still there. 
and it means that it exists. <laughs> it implies that it exists. It doesn't mean that it implies that it exists. And uh, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, um, for the moment, I think that the sun doesn't exist. Let's see in a few years. If I'm still alive, <laughs> let's see what will happen. Leonel? José, we only can be aware about phonemes with the help of the alphabetic principles. There is no other way to be aware of the phoneme. Yes. No possibility. To, we cannot uh, help with the acoustic uh, cues because everything is mixed in the chain of speech. We cannot, we cannot help with this phonetic cues. The mm -hmm. only possibility is with the help of the alphabetic principles. And so it is abstract. No way. Okay. No way. <laughs> okay, I agree. Mm. I think Professor Danuta wants to speak. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I raised my hand. Thank you very much, Angela. Yes, you're welcome. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm neither a cognitive linguist or neurolinguist, but I've wondered whether you could elaborate a little bit more on your concept of literacy, which obviously here you associated with language and cognition, our perception of all different kinds. Do you think we can go beyond uh, the language focus and cognition into nonverbal? Like uh, if we, if you understand, and I do agree completely with that, uh, that literacy adds to changes in our brain, that literacy is primary for interconnectivity, is the nonverbal, like physical activity, part of this literacy. I know that uh, Professor David Green did the studies which, at which he, in which he actually looked at how physical activity affects the brain connectivity, especially in the elderly. Would you put that as yeah. part of literacy? My answer would be that uh, indeed images might be influenced uh, by literacy. And then it would uh, be part of uh, what we call literacy. Uh, but we need more, more uh, information, uh, experimental information about it. Uh, what we know, for example, is that we can perhaps call image uh, the fact that sometimes we have the impression that we hear uh, sentences, spoken sentences, uh, that in our imagistic there is an image of that sentence, but visually and that we read it, and we read it from left to right, or in other cultures, from, for, for example, in Hebrew, from right to left. And it's true. This, this has been shown, so it's clear. And uh, also for uh, the relationship with the temporal, independently of language, temporal events, and there are lots of studies now showing this. So if we, we, we include those kind of images in the concept of literacy, which would be possible because there is a, an influence of literacy, but if we agree in including that in the concept of literacy, then it would be, yes, okay. Now we may discuss, perhaps, perhaps we have to, uh, we are going too far, uh, including it in the, in the concept of literacy. I don't, I don't know, so that's to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, just an idea. Hmm. 
anyone else? Okay. Well, I think we all want to thank you, Professor José Moraes. Thank you very for your much. very, very thank nice you. talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for you all. Like this also. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, thank you very much. We got uh, uh, many people uh, thanking you by uh, written uh, thanking uh, at the chat. So that's also very nice. Thank you very much. Um, if we don't have uh, uh, more questions, maybe we can have a five minutes break between this talk and the next one. It will be all in the same room, so you can keep uh, you can stay connected. Maybe you want to close, uh, keep your mic uh, 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 off, and maybe if you want to uh, also uh, uh, keep your uh, camera on or off, it's up to you really. And then in five minutes we can uh, at uh, seven forty-five Brazilian time. <laughs> uh, um, let's just say it right. Uh, at uh, 11 45 for Lisbon time we can start the next talk is it okay yes good so thank you and we see each other in five minutes
Good. So you, we are back. Thank you, Douglas, for sharing uh, the program with everybody. That's very nice. It was a very helpful idea. So we can keep track of our schedule. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. Um, I think we can do it uh, next breaks also, so we can always keep uh, in mind uh, our timetable. Very good. So now we have uh, um, uh, a round table uh, by uh, Professor São Luis Castro, Professor Ana um, Navas, Professor Regine Kolinsky, and myself, uh, entitled the, uh, with the title "The Impact of Literacy on Verbal Memory and Speech Processing." Um, I I can see. I don't know if Regine Collins, we oui, Regine is is there. Yes. So yeah. would you say something, Regine? <laughs> yeah. No. Except to uh, say thanks say to thanks all to the participants. All the participants. Oh, hello, uh, San Luis and uh, Ana Luisa. Um, we co-organized a long time ago. Uh, was Angela and myself this workshop and thought about. Uh, who are the people working on, um, let's say, current uh, issues in that domain? And it happens, uh, but uh, this is really, um, you know, um, because it was like that, that we ended up with only women, which is a, might be a bit strange, but yeah. It's, um, it's a fact that our first uh, speaker, uh, San Luis Castro from uh, University of Porto in Portugal, uh, is director of an important lab, uh, which for years and years now is studying uh, the impact of literacy and more generally uh, reading acquisition and speech perception. And so, um, yeah, I'm very, very pleased she accepted our invitation. And um, it also happens that uh, in Brazil, uh, I began collaborating with uh, Ana Luisa Navas uh, from Sao Paulo, from the Santa Casa in Sao Paulo, uh, several years ago on uh, speech perception. And so thank you again, uh, Anna Luisa, to also have uh, accepted our invitation. And I won't speak much longer because I think the most interesting part is, of course, what they have to present us. And so I will uh, invite first uh, San Luis Castro uh, to present her talk. Thank you, Regine. Uh uh, I'm now I I don't know if you see me but because now I'm seeing no one and but, yeah we uh, see you yeah we see you okay and uh, in order to make the presentation available uh, I somehow my screen got to be okay so it's a presenter I guess I'm so well um, I'm sorry I'm sorry for this uh, uh, problem here uh um so i have i hope that it works this way and you're seeing my full screen yep it's yes. loading it's loading yeah uh, and now can you and see now the it's perfect, presentation perfect. With the perfect. Title? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, this is always a difficult situation that we are interacting with a green point, but you are there. It's like the phone, in, isn't it? <laughs> we, it, it? Do we really exist as a, as a conversation entity? Well, I'm sorry for this, but uh, um, let's start. So first of all, I'd like to thank Regine for inviting me. It, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you and to be able to interact again with this interesting group of uh, thinkers and to be thrilled by uh, quite challenging views by, by José um, and, uh, and the others that commented on his talk. So let's, uh, without further ado, let, let me get started. 
and uh, uh, the topic is uh, the, the, how we can conceive um, of the uh, spillover effect of alphabetic literacy in speech perception. So this is already quite a restricted topic in the sense that we are culturally biased um, in the sense of here considering only alphabetic literacy to make things a bit simple. And so <clears throat> let me start. Um, well, to start with, I'd like to remind uh, something that was present in previous conversation uh, by Jose, which is that when we interact using speech, our focus is typically on meaning. Um, and in the words of a colleague with a famous name, although not a quite famous one, as listeners, we follow the semantic intention of the speaker. And the sounds are just a means to achieve that goal. But of course, we can also interact with uh, writing, with written language. And the case there is the words written in Portuguese, literacy and literacy in English, and the, the sonogram above corresponds to, 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 that, uh, to that word. So the question that I'd be interested to discuss with you now is how do these two endpoints connect? The first, uh, the intention to communicate and literacy, the two extremes, but more speci specifically, um, the connection between literacy in the alphabetic script uh, as a written form and literacy as a spoken word, which is, of course, not in any alphabetic script. So the question is, how do the unique and easily identifiable segments of alphabetic script connect with the speech stream? It's precisely what we have been talking a few minutes ago. And this from the point of view of the listener. And um, this is no trivial question, as we just uh, discussed, and many uh, quite able, much more able than me, the thinkers have dealt with it and have been puzzled with it. And now I'd like to remind um, a comment by Jacobson, which I find particularly inspiring too. He, in his six lessons about sound and meaning, he said that the act of speaking is a perpetual and uninterrupted movement. Um, and this comment of his is on uh, referring to the work of um, two uh, researchers, one of which was the famous Portuguese phoneticist uh, Manuel Serra, who was considering precisely co articulation and how can we separate sounds, laut abgrenzung. And so this is a uh, the, the awareness that speaking is a perpetual movement. And a, a similar idea is also in the writings of Saussure, for example, when he says that it would be impossible to find subdivisions in the sequence of articulatory movements. But now to the point is we do not know where one sound starts and the other stops. Um, and, well, on the other hand, um, irrespective um, of these perpetual movements and the impossible subdivisions, the fact is that as listeners, we have no trouble dealing with, um, let's call them small segments of sound. And in fact, we are quite sensitive to the way these small segments of sound are ordered and extremely sensitive to little changes in their order. And for this, let's remind an example of Claude de Vistros, it will be in French. And first example is mort de faim before de main. Another nice one is uh, tendez votre verre and vendez votre terre and louez les rois and rouez les lois. Well, we don't know exactly what, we, what was happening in our mind brain, but we did um, capture this uh, position between me, fe, te, ve, le, re. And let us call it tentatively the phonemic level of representation of the phonological level of, of representation, this abstract unit that we were talking um, in the previous discussion. So as we know, uh, the alphabetic script has these uh, units uh, in writing, uh, yet as uh, yeah, they are in writing, 
and there is this long tradition of considering that they exist as opposing and relative and negative entities. So they don't exist in the positive sense, they exist only in as much as they oppose others, they are relative and they are negative because they only exist by opposition, which is a nice idea to uh, convene with this notion that they are quite abstract, in fact. Um, so let's uh, uh, assume that um, these uh, segments, whatever they are, um, they, they, they are functional in our speech perception. And the interesting question uh, arises also from an ontogenetic point of view, because first we speak and perceive speech, and then in our culture, um, or many of not only Western cultures, we become literate and represent phonological segments with letters and graphemes. And uh, what we, I'd like to discuss with you now is how this uh, phonemic or phonological level of representation, which is supposed to be foundational for language processing, and um, how it um, can be uh, contaminated, so to speak, by, by literacy. And doing this with a, a review of uh, very simple behavioral experiments that have compared um, adults who are illiterate for socioeconomic reasons, so they are perfectly able to deal with their lives, they are intelligent people, but socioeconomic reasons they did not um, get in touch with uh, literacy, alphabetic literacy, with um, the typical person who attended school as a child and then had at least nine years of schooling. This would be typical of the Portuguese environment a few years ago. Uh, but because literacy doesn't come alone, it comes typically with schooling, at least in our cultures. And so in order to compare the impact of literacy, trying to disentangle it from schooling, we also have a third point of comparison, which were the semi-literates. These were people who attended school as children, but in contrast to the literates, at most they had seven, four years of schooling, which just for curiosity, in some publications, these people um, uh, are classified as illiterates because of the very low or rudimentary level of, um, of, a bit of schooling and, and, uh, and literacy. And we will do uh, this comparison of um, uh, in listening experiments, so from very from easy to not so easy listening listening conditions, and the task is quite simple. One is just to say what did you hear, and what people might have heard will be either syllables, simple syllables, or words. And so listen to what do you hear in very simple condition. Uh, listen listening to monaural. Um, syllables coming from speech continua, and so the question is subjects have to say which syllable is it, or in a slightly more demanding situation in which one stimulus comes to one ear, the other comes to the other, and you are asked to repeat and say what you have heard on the one ear or on the other ear, so you must pay attention to one ear, not to the other, and there is the possibility of interference. And finally, the most um, demanding condition where words are embedded in noise, which is uh, maybe more similar to everyday situations where often words are masked in the middle of noise. So I'd like to give you an, an idea of what would be the situation of identifying syllables in a speech continuum, and I hope that it works. So I, I'm going to show you if it works. First, a syllable, a natural syllable pronounced by uh, our uh, in Portugal well-known baritone, who unfortunately has passed away some time ago. He said, ah, "I hope you heard it," and he also pronounced the other syllable, "ta." And now it's possible to cross splice bits of ta, six millisecond bits of ta, onto the past syllable and construct a natural speech continuum. Um, I will show you briefly, it, it will be, I think, six stimuli, and what I'll ask you is to uh, be aware of what 
you heard in the beginning and what you heard at the end and how, how did it shift from one to the other if they were different. So I'll present now the series of six stimuli in sequence. Um, so, uh, assuming that I would be a typical <laughs> uh, human being, I started by listening to, by hearing pa, and then after the third stimulus or so, I started to hear pa. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, and this is a, 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 a typical uh, identification function of, of a speech continuum. I'll show you more of it later. Now I just wanted to go back to the study. The study, uh, as all the other studies that I'm going to refer to here, um, involved the combination of literate, illiterate, and semi-literate levels. But here, because we wanted to test the quality of the continuum, we also had college students which were younger. In the other groups, um, we tried as much as possible to have them with the same age. And um, as this round table, all were women. And this uh, is, uh, well, uh, rather sad. And on the other way, in somewhat interesting condition, it is because um, uh, years ago, um, poor people living in the countryside and uh, and uh, being able to only send one child to school, the child was going to school was a man and not the, the woman. And so we ended up with more illiterate women than uh, illiterate men uh, above a certain age. And in order to try to keep our data clear, we just worked with women. The statement task, I'll tell you in a moment about it. This start slide is here so that we can go back to it in case there are some questions. So, in the speech continua that we used here, um, it was based on the same principle of natural, um, natural speech, natural words pronounced by human beings, uh, konga and gonga, and only the first syllable was taken, ko and go, and we could also change uh, the, the syllable um, and make a vilar continuum from k to g by adding voice to the voiceless. So if we add a little bit of voicing within go, which exists in Portuguese, in the voice uh, stimuli, we can add bits of this voicing lead to the uh, voiceless k, and then at some point it transforms itself. Uh, it mor uh, morphs into the, the opposing syllable. So the results for the college students, and what this shows is how many voice responses there were for stimulus, for stimulus zero, which is just the arbitrary number, which is the, the natural k, and then the, the other stimuli have increasing bits of voicing lead from the g. And what do college students hear? Well, they identify very clearly as a k, the first two stimuli, and then abruptly they switch into the other phonological category and they hear mostly g. So this is typical of uh, the identification of speech continua. Again, uh, in quite uh, inspiring experiments from Haskins lab um, in, uh, in 57 already. So the first uh, paper on categorical perception uh, of speech was by Lieberman in 57. Um, but there it is. It's quite replicable. It's one of the most robust findings, um, maybe, uh, in psychology. Uh, so extremes were unambiguously identified and the, abrupt, uh, the boundary was abrupt, which is fine. So this is a good continua. And um, uh, we also had other continua. And just to make um, a, sharp, a quick point, if you see that um, we see here the effect of um, co-articulation because if instead of adding voicing, we removed voicing from the voiceless k, um, even the, without any any um, uh, removing all the voicing, there is co-articulation, and so the first stimulus is still a bit ambiguous, even for university students. Uh, so, uh, and we. Um, not only used the villa continuum, but also labial continuum between pa 
at bar, as shown here. And in both cases, you can see that the, the, the right hand side with the voicing was removed and not added is not so good as the left hand side where the voicing was added. Now, the question, of course, is uh, how do illiterate adults do this uh, task? They are a bit older than students, so we will just compare them with illiterate adults of similar age. And, well, in the good continuum, they are basically undistinguishable. Uh, and semi-literates, let's say two, there's a bit of noise in the middle, but this, the extremes are still unambiguously identified and the boundary is abrupt. Um, in the other stimuli, uh, the situation was not so clear. In the labial uh, continuum, mostly uh, it was a bit different and we can, from this data, um, conclude that there was uh, a literacy effect only in the sense that the extremes and boundaries were not so clear in the uh, illiterates as they were in literates. But if we took only the subgroup of illiterate people um, and semi-literate people who identified clearly the, the endpoints, they had abrupt boundaries. So, in the identification of speech continua, we found no evidence of robust literacy effects on the steepness of the boundary when the extremes were clearly identified, as I just told you. However, we found more instances of ambiguous categories. Uh, grossly speaking, as if uh, generally uh, perception was a bit more fuzzy. The results converged with the CERNI class in a, in a real study of uh, categorical perception with discrimination. Here, uh, this all subject it was to identify speech continuum. Um, let's move on to dichotic listening. Um, and in dichotic listening, um, I, uh, we have the same uh, kind of design. These are different subjects, but basically it's the same type of design of uh, comparison of subgroups. And here, uh, I'm sorry, this slide has a little problem down there, but basically um, two questions are of interest. First is whether there are ear differences um, in illiterate and semi-literate populations as they exist, are known to exist in literate populations. And this was a study published a long time ago. The results for the literate show that there is a, sm a small right ear advantage for um, the the, the dichotic words who are different, for example, cola on the one side and the mesa on the other. And a similar thing happens in the other groups, although their performance level is lower. We, however, also had similar pairs where only one phoneme is different. First, the initial phoneme, for example, cola goa. Um, performance go goes a bit lower, uh, but the advantage is there for literates. It is also there for illiterates, but apparently a bit not so strong, and for semi-literates somewhere in the middle. So if we want just to just check what's the magnitude of the ear advantage, is it similar for literates and illiterates? Is it that literacy somehow either strengthens or um, attenuates the, the left hemisphere uh, dominance or superiority to deal with speech? Uh, if you took all the subjects apparently Yes, in the sense that literates have a higher um, hear advantage um, than the other two groups. That's the blue column on the on the la uh, right. Yeah. However, oh, I'm sorry that this uh, this is <laughs> sorry. I skipped this slide because it I took the wrong um, the wrong slide. But basically. What uh, this slide shows, and so I'm sorry for that quality. I have a good one, but uh, it, it's um, it, it's in the other uh, in the other file. Uh, what this slide uh, attempted to show, and maybe I'll just tell you without the slide because this is a bit confusing, is that if we compare um, uh, literates and semi-literates and literates with this, within the same performance level, which is middle performance level, then this bigger um, uh, advantage of the literacy disappear. So basically, if we compare similar performance level, the ear advantage is similar in literates and illiterates, so it's not affected by uh, being uh, able to read and write in an alphabetic script. 
Another uh, point of this uh, design is that uh, there are many errors, so there's a relatively uh, reasonable quantity of errors, and we can analyze the types of errors that uh, appear, and the analysis <coughs> that we've done, and that was uh, by Moraes and others and myself, uh, show that um, the proportion of error cat is, is different in, uh, in different groups, and the main difference is that the literature show more errors restricted to the first segment. So, whether they are aware of the phoneme or not, the fact is that they err more locally in the first segment, uh, as opposed to the literates who, on the contrary, err more, make more errors in more other, many other segments. So it appears that it's not so focally um, directed to a single segment, uh, to this single phone. So um, from this set of uh, results, we can conclude that the right ear bandage indexing left hemisphere superiority is respective of literacy as an occurrence, as, as, whether it exists or not, um, which uh, be discussed in the literature and was discussed in the literature uh, because it was not clear. Uh, we have also higher performance level associated with the more with the stronger um, involvement of left hemisphere, and that was irrespective of literacy. However, the performance level was modulated by literacy and the pattern of misidentifications also because more single segment errors and fewer errors uh, in fewer global errors occurred in literates than in uh, illiterates. Uh, another uh, interesting feature of dichotic listening is that it allows us to study phonological fusion. So, for example, if on the one ear we uh, are presented with fed and on the other we are presented with breath, we can have um, the percept that combines both segments and perceive fed. This uh, phenomenon has been uh, intensely examined by cutting in the 70s, and we found a few interesting points about uh, this, that some phonemes are more likely to fuse than others, uh, such that, for example, uh, uh, there's more tendency to have phonological fusions with plosives um, than with fricatives, such that, for example, if you are presented with fed and bread, if, and if you make a phonological fusion, this phonological fusion might be more easily be bred with the positive than include the fricative. We used this kind of idea to see whether there were differences, whether in this case, whether related with would also fuse, because that would indicate that the speech processing system uses this a segment uh, size uh, or sing single size segment units. Um, uh, and we have these kinds of uh, stimuli, caralar, parlar. Those of you who speak Portuguese uh, can easily realize that cara and lara be can become clara, par and lar can become plar, and so forth. Well, to cut to the chase, Basically, uh, and again, very much in the line of what cutting in the 70s had already mentioned, some pairs fuse very nicely, others do not. Uh, this shows the results of the literates, and you see that some pairs, well, the other pairs that are not here didn't fuse at all, so only these were able to induce uh, fusions. And um, they were very different uh, in frequency depending on the pair itself. But the illiterates also fused quite a lot. In fact, if you took overall, they had more fusions than the illiterates. Um, and the semi illiterates were somewhere sometimes closer to the illiterates, sometimes um, closer to the to the literates. And interestingly, where were the semi illiterates closer to the literates? So to Let's concentrate on foolish, which is one, two, three, four, five on the fifth word. And you can see that um, the written version of foolish has, um, has an epithetic e uh, vowel. So the, the, the orthographic representation seg at segment level of uh, the letters used has one more letter that is not 
uh, typically present in the acoustic stream because we say flish, we don't say felish as you in Brazil, but the same Portuguese from Portugal, flish, and the same happens with lar. And in, you see that in those two cases, interestingly, the illiterate people who do not have, of course, this orthographic representation, they fuse because it's a l and l fuses very well. Um, but uh, the other two groups who have somewhere hidden this code of literacy, where they have this representation of this mechanism that is able to, uh, to use written language, it detracts them from fusing. So uh, quite interesting um, effect uh, that combines very well with the literature that in the meantime is quite uh, clear. Um, so uh, the segments are recombined into single percepts in literates, there was as in literates. The pattern of fusions is affected by orthography. Um, and um, this is another way to uh, document an effect that says is, is stable, which is the orthographic effect in spoken word recognition that has been found in a variety of paradigms. So because I think I'm coming close to the time, or I, I already exceeded, I'm sorry. So I'm going to uh, speed up now. Words in noise, very quickly, the same type of uh, design. Uh, and um, uh, just to go directly to the point, let's concentrate on the graph on the lower hand. Uh, what this shows is the percent correct words identified in noise. The noise could be contralateral, that is the middle column. And, bi and binaural in both years, which is a very difficult listening condition. And of course, we are able to understand many, much less words when they are embedded in noise in both groups uh, or in the three groups. But if we compare more, uh, more detail, uh, it appears that the decrease from the monaural and contralateral noise conditions to um, the binaural noise, it appears that the illiterates suffer more than the literates and the semi-literates. Um, just to spare you the details, we had several controls of this thing because the baseline of the literates was higher than the illiterates and all the semi-literates, but in both types of controls, the thing that emerged was that uh, even the performance level was modulated by literacy, the detrimental effect of binaural noise was disproportionately strong in illiterates. Uh, and also, interestingly, also in, the, in how uh, the results correlated, for example, with the, with the digit span that we also measured, and the literates and semi-literates had similar patterns of, of performance. So again, it is like if you were once given the opportunity for almost the one, one trial learning of um, having literacy, having the alphabet within your system, then it does affect you, even if you are not typically using uh, the alphabet in your everyday life, as was the case with these semi-literate people. So literacy, not school, it suffices to increase robustness of speech perception and noise. That would be the tentative conclusion that we could draw from this study. Summing up, driven by alphabetic literacy, and this of course is point for discussion. No, in the sense that it's not driven as a basic mechanism of speech processing. Categorical identification of speech continuum. Please note that I'm not discussing and not referring to discrimination, so this is just one part of the story maybe. No, the left hemisphere dominance, it is there. Whether the magnitude is bigger or not, it's also good discuss, but it is there. And also the ability to extract and fuse this entity, these phonemes, whatever that is, um, even if you don't, uh, don't uh, if you are not uh, literate. And yes, um, the functional relevance of the segmental representation for attention-dependent perceptual outcomes. This is a bit weird to say, but I again struggle with how can we say this without being biased and um, using heavy concepts without real meaning. So um, basically this means that if we have to perceive something even though 
we don't have to exert some kind of awareness operation on that. Um, but for perceptual outcomes that are at some level attention dependent and literate because they dominate the alphabetic code, oh, I mean, alphabetic literate, and they are able to use these representations more than those who are not, who don't have them. And uh, so it's also um, uh, an impact and important for the robustness of speech perception, which survives better in worse conditions of noise or dichotic listening. Uh, well, last but not least, I'd like to say that, um, of course, this, much of this work and similar work has been inspired by this uh, paper and this idea that Jose mentioned a while ago of the awareness of speech and the sequence of phones and, and uh, the idea that even though we don't know exactly what it is, that um, our system, our mind brain captures um, these abstract units in how it deals with the speech stream. And so thank you very much for your attention. It's a pity that we cannot join in Porto or in Aveiro or in, in, uh, in Brazil, but maybe some other time we are able to do it and I hope that we are. Thank you again for your attention. Now, uh, I don't know, I have to not pre stop the presentation, right? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Rosangela, Rosangela, is, no. there, is there some time for questions or comments or will we wait for the final session? I think it's better if we have the three, the, the four talks and then later we can discuss. I think it's better three. this way. Yeah, Regine? Yeah. yeah, three talks. Three talks, yes. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, we already are a bit late, so I propose to go immediately to the sudden talk by Ana Luisa Navas. If she's still there, I can't see her. I'm here. Anymore. I'm here. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, here. Hello. <laughs> so um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I thank you very much for the invitation and for the organizing of this conference i know it was not easy but it was worth it just from the beginning it's worth it already um do you see the my presentation already yes Anna. okay and so i thank regine and uh, rosangela for the for the invitation and of course i have to acknowledge uh, what a pleasure it is to be here um, with uh, Professor Leonor and uh, uh, José Moraes, which both in inspire me to, to start with this research very early on, like in the, when I was a student still, and, and with, with a, with a, with a, with a in inspiration that still follows me uh, all around. I'm sorry, I got a bit emotional remembering old times. So, um, Professor Luis, uh, San Luis Castro had a very nice job um, preparing many of the things that I'm going to talk now, and we will keep um, discussing here and, and bringing some reflections on the impact of alphabetic literacy on uh, the perception of the speech sounds. And um, I will just um, also acknowledge some of the early work on speech perception. And um, my dear professors, Studer Kennedy and Don Schenkweiler, who very early on um, started to talk about the difference between auditory perception and speech perception. So the, the auditory system has in both hemispheres um, a way of extracting acoustic parameters of the speech signal, but it's the dominant hemisphere 
that is specialized in extracting linguistic information from the acoustic signal. At least at that point, that's what they they thought, and that that work influenced um, a lot of people to start looking at more detail. And in '67, they published a paper called "Perception of the Speech Code," and um, this this paper was obviously very influential for many people interested in the topic. And 50 years later, um, some of the authors, um, and with the audition of Carol Fowler, uh, changed a little bit the, the title of the paper and revisited that topic, saying that speech perception, uh, after all, is alphabetic, or speech is alphabetic after all. So showing already that um, the implications of the uh, uh, alphabet uh, on the perception and 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 our language um, processing in general. So, um, saying that, we had a lot of studies uh, showing the impact of speech perception on learning to read. So this this is clear from uh, the the way we perceive uh, speech and all sorts of phonological tasks, metaphonological tasks, being um, related to, to the easy that we learn how to read and write and the, the better uh, phonological processing, uh, the easiest it is to, to acquire some, some of the early uh, steps of reading, and also many studies relating to, to the deficits in, in phonological processing related to uh, difficulties in learning to read. So that is very clear for many, uh, even though we are talking about and we have to consider uh, what Professor Moraes just said in his previous talk, um, but it is very clear then um, for the comparison between readers in non-alphabetic scripts and alphabetic alphabetic scripts, this, uh, this role of uh, phonological processing is very different. Uh, the, many studi studies comparing illiterate adults and uh, adults, as we've seen in, in many of the cited uh, studies already in this talk, and also studies comparing through development how pre-readers do, do not have the same level of, of awareness or phonemic awareness than children that are already readers. So um, it seems that in this direction, there is um, uh, lots of evidence showing the influence of uh, the abilities to perceive speech or to process in this metaphonological way uh, in learning to read. But our question is, what happens when then we learn to read? Um, so what are the changes in our uh, language system and uh, right, right now we're just talking about language, but we know that there's much more to that as we, we heard from Jose Moraes' talk. Um, but several things happen then when we learn to read. And the, the question we wanted to ask with this, uh, with this study is, was that um, once we learn how to read and write, and I am not, I'm not talking about comprehension or other more complex levels of, of reading, but just the fact that we identified words and we have the connection between orthography and phonology that in turn may change the way we perceive and we process uh, phonological units. So we, we set up um, to, to do a task um, most, most known for for several of you but since it's it's uh, has this little details i will take a few moments to to describe a categorical perception task as we used in in the experiment and then i will describe uh, what we did in in this study so um, the same way that professor uh, castro showed so we can we can produce a continuum of uh, uh, acoustic changes from a here we used in in the experiment we we will talk about 
D and T. Both of them are syllables in Portuguese and, uh, and they also are name of letters. So the, the way we, we name the letter T and D, we use T and D in Portuguese. So those are like very common and frequent uh, syllables in, in Portuguese. And we can um, provide um, manipulation and of the voicing continuum here. So they're the same in manner and way of pronunciation and in place of pronunciation, uh, but they, they differ in the voicing continuum. And so we can uh, use, used as described by Professor Castor before, an identification task which is just to say, is this a D or is this a T when we listen through, through headphones? But we also um, used a discrimination task. So we presented two stimuli, D, T or D, D. And the question was, is this a, is, are those the same or are those different syllables or sounds? Um, so uh, this, this the extremes of the continuum are natural language. There were recordings um, from a, a male uh, speaker and they were manipulated acoustically so that we had uh, six steps of, uh, of stimuli, of items to be uh, produced. And of course, when, when you have this uh, in the middle part of the continuum, the, the acoustic signal is very similar but they still belong to, to different categories. And that, that what make the, 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 the task interesting to, to measure the ability to perceive different categories. But more than that, uh, we can measure the precision in which those categories are identified. So those, um, those are, as, as mentioned before, very, very well studied um, abilities through several papers. And here I used the uh, uh, very early on from Studio Kennedy and, and collaborators who, who set up this, what we expect. So this is a, a nice um, curve for the identification of the categories and then what we expect for the discrimination is like a peak when you have like within the same category of the of the syllables um, a fifty percent chance of, of saying that they're same or different, but between categories we're um, or some some of us are really precise to say that they're diff or uh, they're different categories. So um, we can measure categorical perception estimated through the relation between the, how well you are for identifying those phonemes or those uh, syllables and the discrimination as well. And then when we want to look for the categorical precision, we look at the scope, the slope or the peak, the size of the discrimination peak as you will see in a minute. So this, this was a good uh, choice uh, for our question. Um, we wanted to see the impact of alphabetic literacy on the perception of speech sounds. And um, a good way to do it was to compare um, different levels of literacy in, in different groups. And they were all uh, participants of Brazilian Portuguese speak, uh, language in Sao Paulo all of the participants come from a low social economic status um, as as you might uh, understand and also they were screened for auditory uh, skills like basic auditory skills since it was mainly an auditory task we wanted to make sure that they were um, uh, they didn't have any uh, low accuracy in in, aud in audition and in fact many of the adult subjects were excluded from the sample uh, because of auditory problems. And we also screened for uh, some basic cognitive with a mini mental state examination um, with, with uh, the scores for, 
for an uh, illiterate or unschooled population. So we had three groups. Um, in fact, we had two groups of adults, illiterates, but we called them unschooled. They, they, were, they had very little literacy and um, some of them, uh, most of them were attending literacy classes and some schooled adults which, which had learned how to read and write in childhood, but are still with, with low literacy skills. And second grade uh, children. Um, also, I have to say that unfortunately, second grade children in Brazil are also very low literacy. They're still not fully literate at this age. So we, we recorded uh, several reading performances and word reading, pseudo word reading. Uh, a measure of reading fluency, uh, taking the words per minute, which in in uh, in Portuguese is a is a important measure because you can read but uh, take much longer to to do it, and um, letter knowledge and three metaphonological tasks: a phonological sensitivity, an initial syllable deletion, and an initial phoneme deletion. And um, we added a rapid automized naming for objects and digits. Um, since there's no, uh, we, we, we thought there was no influence on, on literacy on this measure, which is just naming letters and objects and measuring the time to do it. So, so that was the task, as I mentioned, just to remind you. So we presented uh, subjects with first the identification task whether they had to listen and say if it was a day or a te and the discrimination task just after that so they had to say if, we, if it was the same or different pair of um, of a stimuli so the they uh, had no problem in performing the test they all understood what what was um, the task uh, and um, performed like several uh, samples of it so that we, we got nice curves here. And so this is the result for the identification task, as mentioned by uh, the same way for several other studies, there was no difference between the groups. And uh, we tested before the difference between the two groups of, of adults and also uh, the unschooled adults and children. And so for the, the identification, there was no difference between them. So they all recognized uh, clearly the, the isolated syllable presented. But uh, for the discrimination, they, they were also, this is the curves for the, for the discrimination. So that's the, the solid line they observed performance and the dotted line as you see is uh, as you can see here is the expected one and what we see is that school adults have a match a match between observed and expected but um, for the unschooled there was um, a, a slight different performance here and so for the second grade children but that means that for the categorical precision, there was a difference between groups here. Furthermore, when we performed correlation, um, the correlations between, for, for all participants all together, we could see that the discrimination here on the, on the, on the axis is the discrimination peak, the, the size of the discrimination peak with reading fluency and phonological awareness. And that shows also um, a correlation. So, uh, so we see that the, the better the literacy level, uh, the better it is uh, to the precision for the, the categorical uh, decision. So what we 
we can say, at least for now, is that literacy uh, did not modulate categorical perception, as we see. So there was no difference in, in, in the way that, that the three groups perceived different categories. Uh, even for for kids with uh, not not very good literacy, but uh, already um, have good categorical perception. But on the other hand, the level of literacy did show an impact in the precision of these phoneme phonemic categories, and um, so showing that uh, knowing how to read at least for some level fine-tune our our perception of these uh, phonemic categories so uh, the impact of literacy is independent of age because of course if we compare the same level of reading um, accuracy or le level from the kids the children group and the unschooled adults they they were they were matched for reading level and they still had the same performance in the precision task. So this, this brings us to um, some um, nice uh, addition to the, to, to the knowledge that was already known in the literature. Um, we, we, we try to, to get the level of uh, social economics as as uh, comparable as we could and also uh, we used uh, different different syllables for these comparisons that are very frequent in uh, in portuguese uh, to avoid any bias of uh, lexical or like a more more frequent uh, syllable than than the other and um it is also um important that we start to think of these questions in in the way we looked at um, dyslexia or the causes for for dyslexia that have been uh, for for many many reasons related to uh, phonological processing failures so it is well established that dyslexics have low phonological awareness um, and phonological processing in general problems. But um, this recent paper, like a fairly recent paper, started to discuss um, what is cause and consequence. And I think this is a nice story to be told still and um, much more uh, has to be done. Initially in our study, we wanted to test a group of uh, dyslexics as well in, in the same, um, study but it was not possible but it's still a, a matter of investigation and uh, so that we can explore more the, the relation between is there lack of experience that causes some some of the difficulties they have or um, is there any other different uh, proposal uh, with with the influence of of literacy as the background so still a lot to do still a lot to uh, to to explore but um i thank a lot for this collaboration with Regine and uh, and all the friends that help um, not only to to get this the study in in brazil but also uh, through the discussions over time and um i will I will end it with a with a quote in in Portuguese, but I will translate that one of our subjects from this study um, said that it's important to to learn how to read and write because when you see a name and you don't read or you cannot read, it's like being blind. And um, he explicitly asks me to every time I talk about this study or of illiterates that I that I remember that we're talking about people and um, as Morai says our brain learns how to read and write but in fact is uh, is about people and it's about uh, knowing how to help better 
teaching reading and and making them reading so that we we are not looking at words where we can um, make it literacy a much much more um, robust for everybody so i thank you again and i hope we will have nice discussion after this Thank you very much, uh, Ana Luisa. Um, time is running, so I'm afraid we have to rush to the third and final talk. And so uh, Rosangela Gabriel will talk about um, the possible influence of uh, literacy on uh, verbal memory this time. So thank you, Rosangela. Good. I think great. Now I can start presenting from uh oh just a second. From the beginning. Good. Yes. So uh well good morning now officially has a uh someone who is going to to talk a little bit. I um so we have this uh, the, the this round table is called the impact of literacy on verbal memory and speech processing, and I want to thank Regine, uh, San Luis Castro, and Ana Luisa for uh, joining us uh, in this uh, round table. I think this is a very nice moment for all of us. So thank you for very much for accepting and for being together in this round table. I'd like to start uh, uh, just saying that we have people here from uh, very many, many places in the world. So I want to say that uh, we are, uh, this research group is based on Brazil in the very, very south state of Brazil. And we are in the middle of uh, our state which is in the really in the southest uh, state of Brazil. My university is UNISCI and as Professor Leonor said, we are um, doing the, this uh, technological uh, uh, support uh, to the event. I want to thank all the students who are participating uh, uh, as listeners, but also with uh, monitoring the rooms that we will have during the three days of our event. So thank you very much for accepting. I don't know if you are aware, but today is a holiday in Brazil. So it's a national holiday. And uh, so for us, it's uh, an extra effort because uh, students would be uh, uh, in a holiday today, but they will be working with us. So thank you very, very much for uh, this uh, extra effort during the three days uh, of holiday at our university and that you will be all working uh, with us. Thank you so, so much. I'm really grateful for that. I'm also grateful for the group uh, at uh, WellB, which is part of the um, work I will show you was uh, uh, really um, uh, Regine Kolinsky and also Catherine Demolin. They are very, uh, and Professor Jose Moraes, they are uh, with both hands and all the data I will and things I will present. So um, I had the opportunity to spend uh, one year in 2015 with Professor Jose Moraes and Professor Regine Kolinsky at University uh, Libre de Bruxelles. And so I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity that I um, had. So um, thank you. So thank you to the, all the people who had contributed to the work as well. Well, I would like to start uh, going very far from the uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, World and going to uh, just uh, um, maybe you have seen this movie or maybe you have heard of this movie. 
So a uh, few years ago, uh, Arrival uh, was launched. It's a movie based on a short story. Uh, this is the book of the short story. So Arrival is a science fiction drama film based on the short story, Story of Your Life by Ted Chiang. And in this uh, story, uh, extraterrestrials have come to help humanity. They teach a linguist their language, which changes humans' linear perception of time, changing the awareness of time, allowing them to experience memories of future events. So their language is not linear, their language is more circular, like this. So uh, uh, the science fiction can uh, uh, raise questions that we wouldn't uh, dare uh, to ask in a paper, but it's interesting to think about them. So uh, does our sequential speech or our sequential written language shape a sequential mind? Or alternatively, is a sequential mind responsible for the sequential speech and sequential written language? And uh, could we think about having a, 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 an alternative non-sequential mind alternative to ours? So those are the questions um, uh, the, the book and the movie uh, raise. So, I thought that would be interesting to start thinking about this sequential uh, 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 kind of thinking that we have, because uh, uh, sequential order is very important for us in terms of reading abilities. So now I, I, I go for the uh, uh, really uh, our uh, more um, I would say serious uh, talk, but uh, I would like to uh, just um, make this alternative uh, way to think um, arise from uh, uh, our beginning to, to, to think about literacy has and schooling uh, has two uh, uh, strong um, uh, uh, ways to carve our verbal serial order memory and this work was uh, really uh, a collaborative work so that's why we have here uh, Regine and me so uh, so this is a little bit of what we will have in this talk uh, so in what extent the acquisition of lift of literacy transforms the human memory this is the basic question that we are asking here Several studies have been pursuing answers to this question and have been showing that human memory systems are highly influenced by culture, which induces the design of categories for information, storing and retrieving. In our talk, we will discuss studies of serial order reconstruction, reconstruction task conducted to investigate whether formal schooling and literacy carve verbal serial order memory we will have three experiments the first uh, with the uh, um, children in brazil the second with children in brussels and the third with adults um, and the three experiments have the 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 intention to uh, see in which uh, uh, level serial order reconstruction performance is uh, um, related to literacy abilities. So we can start asking, what's memory? So we, we, we usually have this uh, um, um, definition that memory is the acquisition, formation, maintenance, and evocation of information. But also, it's important to think about memory as the way we represent information in our brain. So this is uh, 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 the, the, the question is how we represent the information that we have in our brain. Uh, and when we think about memory, we, we can uh, uh, think about different types of uh, 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 memories uh, according to Dura duration, 
content, awareness, verbal uh, memory. And different models focus on different aspects of human memory. So I brought here uh, badly uh, three models, the evolution, the first model, so just with the three components. Then later, the second model, uh, which is much more complex. And then the, the third model uh, of uh, working memory. And also brought, uh, just to, to bring to mind, the model of Cohen, where he is more uh, uh, um, concerned about attention control. Uh, and how attention control will uh, activate part of the information in long-term memory. Yeah, and we also brought here uh, Majerus, uh, which is going to uh, uh, focus on a very uh, more precise uh, and small part of memory, working with uh, selective attention, yes, but uh, uh, sublexical phonological network and the lexical phonological network, but uh, uh, being trying to uh, uh, focus on the sequence detection, detection and also the sequence maintenance of uh, 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 elements in a in our in a, one order. So if you think about uh, our uh, uh, everyday world, we we can have memory for items for example i have to bring five items from the supermarket supermarket so it doesn't really matter what uh, items i will have in my basket first because as far as i bring the five items home i'm happy uh, with that uh, solution but regarding reading it doesn't work like that you have to keep uh, uh, track of the items themselves, but you also have to keep track of the, the sequence the items are, because you have different words depending on uh, one sequence or the other. So you have to keep track of two kinds of memories, the item memories and also the maintenance, maintenance of sequence. So this is really what we are looking at at this uh, paper here. So when we work with working memory uh, tasks, working memory spun, we, uh, this is a citation from Cohen, the distinction between, between short-term memory and working memory is one that depends on the definition that one accepts. So we have different definitions and we have different uh, uh, names for uh, the concepts. Nevertheless, the substantive question is why some tests of memory over the short term serves as some of the best correlates of cognitive aptitudes, whereas others do not. So this is the solution uh, Cohen brings to the problems of uh, different categories uh, and different concepts of working memory. So it's highly accepted that temporary memory acts as a bottleneck for learning with weak memory capacities leading to learning difficulties, including the literacy acquisition. However, however, it's not the word, uh, right word, but additionally, we can add another question that is put by Demolin and Kolinsky in a paper in 2015 do the reverse question uh, also be true? Does learning to read improve verbal working memory? So, okay, working memory is important to, for learning, but learning to read also have a, a washback effect, also go uh, improves working memory. This is the question um, Demolin and Kolinsky made. Uh, well, we have already uh, 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 mentioned in different speeches today, in different talks today, uh, this paper by uh, uh, José Moraes and colleagues uh, in uh, 1979. 
And we, ha we uh, uh, have accepted, we have several evidences that learning to read improves phoneme awareness, the ability to manipulate the individual phonemes. Also, learning to read impacts the recall of serial order because while decoding, singular letter sounds must be added and kept in order to form words, training the brain for serial order processes. And learning to read boots, explicit representations of speech in different layers, because language awareness comes in layers. You can have phonological awareness, morphological awareness, lexical awareness, synthetic and textual, semantical awareness. Uh, but when we go for testing, uh, uh, um, the impact of uh, literacy, we have a little bit of trouble because has uh, 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 stated in this paper by the hand Cohen, Moraes and Kolinsky, 2015, we have methodological considerations in literacy research because when we compare unschooled illiterate adults with school literate adults, we, we have the effect of literacy and schooling. So this is something that we have also, we have to keep in mind that we have this two components uh, uh, interacting. And also when we uh, follow children, uh, so looking at their performance in different levels, we also confound literacy with schooling in age. So one big challenge for research is how to keep track in, of each variable without confounding uh, 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 with the others. So uh, we have here just a few uh, uh, situations of li re literacy and our schooling, and we will show how we try to uh, 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 work with these variables. So to, to answer the question, do formal schooling in literacy car verbal serial order memory? we conducted three studies. The first one was conducted in, uh, with 120 Brazilian children. They were either uh, preliterates, uh, uh, so uh, in kindergarten, first uh, uh, school year and second school year. They had various socioeconomic backgrounds they were uh, uh, tested in their reading knowledge uh, using different uh, uh, um, instruments. Uh, so letter knowledge, complex grapheme knowledge, phoneme uh, sensibility, initial syllable detection, delay, deletion. And the task was a serial order reconstruction task adapted by Majorus et al. And uh, so they had to, uh, they, we, we, tell, we told them a, a, a short story about they, every year in a crazy school on Children's Day, children get crazy gifts, winning from two to seven gifts, depending on their age. Look at the possible gifts. So then the experiment showed the children each of the cards corresponding to each of the gifts, and then began the test by an example. I will tell you what the children will win and in what order, from the first to the last gift. After listening, you place the gift cards on their staircase. In this staircase, placing the first gift in the highest step, and then the second on the second step, and this for all the cards. So the results we got. So and the words were all were all imaginable words in in Portuguese, and they were uh, small words. So flor, sol, no, pé, cão, rã e boi. So the correlation between performance on serial order reconstruction and literacy scores remains significant after controlling for the effect of, effect of age. Uh, so the data suggests that schooling and or literacy in addition to age are related to serial order memory. So that's experiment where we examine it if literacy acquisition bolsters serial order memory. So this goes for the second experiment. So the second experiment was conducted in Brussels with 54 French speakers. In Brussels, 
uh, they have in Belgium, they have putting a, a point cut off date. So children who are uh, uh, have their anniversary um, made six uh, became six years old by 31st of December, they go to first grade. And the others who are maybe two or three or five days or a month apart in, in terms of age, uh, 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 not having six years in the first of December, they stay in kindergarten. So we have three groups in this study. The children who are uh, in kindergarten, uh, the children who are young first graders, and children who are the older first graders. Okay, so this is the way to to uh, uh, look uh, to keep keep uh, track of uh, the age um, difference. Uh, they also were tested in many reading uh, knowledge uh, uh, um, aspects, and they also perform a very similar uh, serial order reconstruction test. So the serial order reconstruction performance was significantly correlated with old literacy related scores uh, uh, for word reading, pseudo word reading, phoneme deletion, uh, 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 syllable deletion. And um, so data supports the idea that development of serial order memory in children is more related to school activities and in particular to literacy acquisition than per, uh, to age per se. Uh, the third experiment, we examine whether schooling levels in literacy acquisition are also related to serial order memory in ad adults uh, 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 participants. So the third experiment was uh, uh, done with 35 Brazilian adults uh, they were all uh, uh, from low uh, incomes. Uh, they vary in uh, levels of schooling and literacy. Ten had not attended school at all, so they were the illiterates. And 25 had attended school, uh, but they vary a lot in terms of their uh, reading knowledge. Okay. Um, and we had uh, reading uh, knowledge tested and also shorter memory tasks. The zero order reconstruction performance remained significant correlated to the average reading score even after partially out of the effect of average phoneme awareness. Um, well, so do you have the statistics there, but then um, more specifically, serial order reconstruction performance it remains significantly correlated to both word and pseudo word reading fluency. So, when considering the partial correlations between literacy and short term memory performance while controlling for the effect of number of school years, literacy tended to remain correlated with serial order memory performance and remaining significantly correlated to the to item short-term memory performance. So going back to the question, do, perf do formal schooling in literacy carve verbal serial order memory? We can say yes, because that was stable in all the groups we, we were testing. And for the discussion, so memory abilities are fundamental to both general communication abilities, such as language comprehension and production, and scholastic abilities, such as reading, mathematics, and problem solving. In addition, the present study results suggest that the converse relationship also holds true, namely that growth of memory abilities, at, last, at least of verbal order memory depends on the exposure to formal schooling and particularly to on literacy acquisition. In the present case, when both the task and the material are easy for all age groups, it seems that it is the power of the schooling experience, including literacy acquisition, that shapes memory for serial order. Taken together, both study studies provide further empirical support for the role of schooling and its related experience, such as literacy acquisition, the development of verbal memory. 
on the development of verbal memory. The present, re present results suggest that it's not maturation per se, but experience at school, and in particular literacy acquisition that explain the performance jump. Well, most of what I say, uh, what I said is in this paper that is, was published last year in 2020, uh, the influence of age schooling literacy and socioeconomic status on serial order memory. Uh, this is the group of people who work together to make this data and this uh, um, conclusions possible. And I would like to thank you for your attention and thank uh, to Regine as well. I think I didn't go too much of my time or, or I did maybe. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's okay. Thank you, Ms. Angela. Um, I'm just afraid that we won't have as much time for the discussion as, as we would like. Um, What's the limit, last limit for closing the discussion? Uh, it's it's 9.30, uh, um, 9.30, no, it's uh, 11. 30, okay. Yes. So so we yes. have about 15 minutes for uh, questions and uh, discussion. So um, maybe I will ask to the public, to the audience to, uh as a question immediately oh i see jose who has a question we cannot hear you jose we can't hear you yes it's i always forget okay. the, the micro no it's well, okay now i have a question but before asking the question i want just to say very rapidly that it was a great pleasure to listen to you you, uh, three of four ladies, three of whom are very, very dear friends, and one is not exactly <laughs> well. But uh, let, let's see the question. Uh, I thought during the, this uh, your presentations that there is something that we never uh, asked or tried to know. Uh, the influence of the uh, well, what could be the influence on different aspects of language of the degree of uh, literacy influence on illiterate people. So uh, there are literate people who may live uh, among, sorry, there are illiterate people who may live among, uh, is principally, more, more, most of the time among illiterate, but also illiterate people who live with uh, literate people in a literate environment. So I would want to know what could be the, I don't know if it's easy to, to run, to find these, uh, these uh, uh, samples, but if it were in, uh, possible, I think it would be interesting to, to look for the possible effect of this variable on the on the categorical precision differences one probably there would not be i don't know second on phonological memory uh, then on lexical knowledge and i would believe i would bet that there would be a, an effect a clear effect, and then on comp comprehension of grammatically complex sentences. You see, so uh, an increase from small influence or perhaps no influence. To, but, uh, yeah. Huh. Sorry? Yeah, but I'm not sure that it has never been done. I mean, it has never been done as regards memory, nor as regards um, speech perception but you yourself you were um co co-promoting co-directing a phd in which uh you looked at that as regards uh, semantic knowledge 
it was oh, yes. Selina, yeah. Selina Macedo's work in uh, Florianopolis at the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina. And uh, she studied, well, the way she found it was a bit different the situation, but it yeah. will Rural you you, the, the yeah, you you okay. always will have some kind of that kind of correlation. So there was a group of very um, let's say isolated rural people, uh, illiterate ones, and there was a group of uh, urban illiterates. If I and remember, obvious, there were differences. Yeah, and obviously they were quite different in terms of exposure to other literate or illiterate people with a higher, much higher rate of illiteracy uh, in uh, the rural, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, area mm -hmm. compared to the city, of course. Okay. And uh, the results were drastically different in terms of semantic knowledge. I mean, these were a series of experiments about uh, synonymy, antonymy, etc. So basic uh, semantic knowledge. And there was a huge effect there. Yes, but it was never published paper. No, unfortunately not. Well, but maybe if we tell Selina that this was mentioned now, maybe that will motivate her to go <laughs> back to her data. <laughs> maybe. But anyway, uh, my idea was to compare different degrees or different aspects of language from speech identification sure, to, sure. Uh, there is nothing there yeah. to grammatics grammatical knowledge yeah i i don't believe it would affect profoundly I, I mean basic speech perception process i would be surprised but maybe it's worth looking at it but definitely if it affects semantics i would bet my bet would be that there would be an effect uh, in terms of syntactic processing or syntactic awareness as well. And probably, not sure, but probably at the level of memory as well. Yeah, but I would bet That's more the bet. effect I mean. for grammatics than for uh, lexical. Sorry? I would bet uh, uh, that we would get a bigger effect for grammatics than for uh like for uh, okay but well, it's just a bit Not sure. well, i like to bet okay <laughs> <laughs> okay the bet is open who wants to join <laughs> okay is there Regine, another question Regine? 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 yes 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 Leonor. Uh, it, it it was a so rich round table that i have a lot of uh, comments to make. Uh, thank you for all all these magnificent presentations. But first of all, uh, I want to discuss something that I think it's it's in some way neglected. The first step for processing in reading the beginning is recognizing the letter figures mm -hmm. yes and these do not depend upon uh, uh, phonemic awareness because you see for example you have the write the word late l a t a for recognizing the figures letters it does not depend upon the language it depends upon the system for instance we we adopt the uh, uh, Roman uh, alphabet. Okay. It, it, it's the same for English written uh, text, for French written text. And so the features, the invariant features, what we must recognize are the invariant features 
in the occipital temporal left region. This is done first. It is a automatic, not consciousness, very, very, very fast, but it must be done. And so letters do not have sounds. Letters do not have sounds. Graphim, graphims have values that is, they represent phonemes. And then for, inst for instance, in the word massa, in Portuguese, M-A-S-S-A, -S -S we have four letters, but we have sorry, five letters, but we have four graphemes and we have four phonemes. So, right, so this, I, I think that it's, we must, yeah. we, we must make this distinction. And I think that uh, uh, there are no so many uh, research made about that specific point uh, which must be done. I have some, um, some uh, punctual comments uh, 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 and uh, I want specifically direct for each, of, each one of the presenters. Uh, is, uh, San Luis Castro, uh, I think that there is, uh, this point was very well discussed in Rosangela Gabriel uh, presentation. I think that classifying the groups only attending to the grades, it's not, it, it's not uh, enough. Because for instance, in Brazil, we have students in the nine grade that are functional Ill illiterate. Yeah. Sure. I think that, uh, for instance, Rosangela uh, show, showed, spoke about other instruments for classifying the groups. So this is uh, something I, I want to, to uh, comment. Now, uh, about, uh, uh, now it is, um, sorry. It is, the second presenter that was no, uh, Ana, Ana Luisa. Ana, Ana, yes. Hmm? Ana, oh? Ana Luisa. Ana Luisa Nava. Well, um, I have a question, uh, 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 one comment about one of the stimulus that was uh, a, a syllable. T-E-D-E. -E. Notice that if it was written to be read, to be recognized as T or D, it should have this circumflex accent because it, it would be a stressed syllable. Most part of the Brazilian sociolinguistic uh, varieties, they pronounce this unstressed syllable as chi g, which is uh, a palatized and affricate first consonant, so uh, it would be 
totally different. Yeah. But I, it was I, purely auditory, Leonor. It was yeah. purely auditory. It was just only auditory. I know, I know, but even though, even though I talked about that, the isolated syllable, we cannot see if it is pronounced stressed or unstressed because you only can, can see that in the chain speech. The isolated sound. Well, I, I only, I only uh, suggest one small difference. Change the vowel. Put the vowel A. Ah. No. That was ah. that would be a mistake because then you will get a word for that, one no, point da, of the continuum. Yeah. Da, yeah. Yes, da yes, is but, a word. But, 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 no, sorry, but there is the third person singular of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, verb dar in the present subjunctive. Leonor, these are word. two words. These it's are two also words. a word. <laughs> sorry, yeah, Regine. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> what Ana Luisa explained that these are two words, de and te, are two letter names letter in Portuguese. Name. Yes. And so these are two words. So, of course, you might have a lexical boost, but it will be for one point of the continuum as well as for the other. And yes. we Sorry. already, Regine, we already did observation. the experiment with the A letter, and that is a mistake we did in our 2005 paper with Willy Cerny class, because then you get one of the endpoint with a, a word and the other not, and that is unbalanced. So it's better yes. to, you are right to say that it's a word, but the other is a word as well, and that is important. The right? name of the word in most part of the dialects is said chi and G, sorry, the name of the letters. I, I don't yes. think so in some part. The majority, the majority of the varieties, in the majority of the varieties, they pronounce G and G. But anyway, this is something, uh, only a suggestion. I have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, comments about uh, uh, Rosangela presentation, some suggestions also. You began your presentation talking about uh, the types of memory and uh, the problem of sequentially processing. And I, I was thinking that uh, sequentially processing is one of the characteristics of the left hemisphere uh, comparing if the right one with, with the, the major, major characteristic. Uh, usually we made this distinction that the uh, Jose can correct my my comments, but usually we contrast uh, the main characteristic of the right uh, the left hemisphere is sequentially processing, uh, and the right one is the holistic global one. This is one comment. And uh, the, another comment is, uh, uh, you did not mention, two types of memory, uh, the declarative and procedural uh, processing that I think that is, is uh, worth, worth considering. 
and uh, 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 relating to working memory uh, that you comment that the processes are bottom up but the phonological loop that is one of the components of the working memory, it depends also on top-down processes because we have to recur to our phonemic knowledge. You see? And so there are also top-down processes involved in uh, working memory. Well, I think that this is enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Leonor, for these comments. Um, are there any other questions? Because we should hurry. Uh, other uh, session are beginning right now. So, um, I don't see any other question. No. Okay. So, thank you again to all of you, especially, of course, to our presenters, but to everybody and including to you, Leonor, for your interesting comments and Jose for your interesting suggestion. And um, yeah, we can't get uh, to uh, together to drink a coffee, but I will mentally drink <laughs> it with you. <laughs> okay, and I say you bye bye, and thanks again. Thank you. So, Thank you. Bye. The rooms are already open for the, the symposiums. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Let's uh, rest in five minutes. <laughs>